Today we are visiting one of the largest aquariums in the world. It is the third largest aquarium in the Western Hemisphere and it is called Shed Aquarium in Chicago. When I got there I realised that this is so much more than just a normal aquarium centre. This aquarium centre has biotopes from all over the world. You name it, so Australia, Asia, Africa, even the Great Lakes as well. In this video, we're gonna do a full tour and have a look at some of the setups that they've got, some of the really nice setups and scapes that they've done, and also some of the creepier creatures that I would have felt a lot better not knowing that they existed in the world. I really hope that you enjoy this video. If you do, don't forget to give it a like. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. And if you're enjoying my content and you wanna support it and see more of this content in the future, make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you can help us reach that goal of getting to 50,000 subscribers. Being from Australia, I just had to go and check out the Australian setups first. The rainbow fish they have in here were actually from Papua New Guinea and they did have a fly river turtle which is Australian, but the rainbow fish not so much. However, I don't blame them because the Papua New Guinea rainbow fish can be a little bit brighter and more colourful than some of the Australian varieties that we've got here. So for those who don't know, I've actually done a few videos going out and trapping some of the native rainbow fish that we've got here. That's a glass fish there. You've got four different fish in oh, there. Rainbow fish gosh, there. Gosh, gosh. <laughs> four different types. Four different catch. Here in Australia, we've got crimson spotted rainbow fish, which are a really common variety in the creeks around Brisbane and Queensland, where I live. And we also have a bunch of smaller ones like honey blue eyes, which I've also got in one of my aquariums. Rainbow fish are native to Australia and Papua New Guinea and some in Madagascar too. So these ones that you're seeing here, we've got the Bosmani rainbow fish and the red rainbow fish, which are from Papua New Guinea. Then we've got the fly river turtle, which is also from there, but you can also find them in Australia. A really interesting little fact about these fly river turtles is that they don't breed until they're 20 years old. They're the only type of sea turtle that's freshwater. And so what that means is that they don't need to come up and rest on land. They can stay permanently underwater water, swimming around and just come up for air. That's why they've got those nice good swimming fins on them. We actually saw one of them at Aqualand as well. And even though these turtles are from Australia, I hadn't heard of them until I actually visited America where they're quite popular. We can keep them here in Australia too. It's one of the few things that we can keep here since they're native here, but they're just not all that common. I had a little bit of a Google to see if there are any available, not that I would be planning on getting one anytime soon. And I found one and it was worth a couple thousand dollars and then I found an article about someone getting arrested for selling them or taking them from the wild illegally or something. So it's not a huge trade for them over here. Then what we moved on to is some lungfish. So Australian lungfish. These guys, shout out to Bodji from Australia, my friend who's got Neo, his lungfish, or Crocodile Lung D, we also call her. We actually saw a habitat where these guys breed, which is also around in Brisbane, Australia, one of their habitats. Apparently this is a lungfish breeding ground, and apparently there's normally lots of val here as well, but because of the floods it's been washed away a little bit too. These guys are endangered in Australia. You can keep them, but you have to have a special license and birth certificate to be able to do it because they monitor basically how their population and everything so people aren't taking them from the wild and selling them illegally. Really interesting fish, as the name suggests, they can breathe with lungs, so they can breathe oxygen. So they're kind of like that little middle part of evolution before the fish finally went onto the land. There's also African varieties of lungfish, which I saw at Ohio Fish Rescue. Some some of these varieties kind of have almost like little arms as well, it's pretty cool. They look like little dragon kind of flowy bits that hang off them. But these varieties that you're seeing here are the Australian ones, mixed in with those Papua New Guinea rainbow fish. And then across from the rainbow fish, we have our paddle fish. This is also a type of fish that I had only ever seen on Facebook and Instagram until I came to America because we unfortunately did not have these guys in Australia, but I absolutely love them. I saw some really big ones in the pond at Ohio Fish Rescue as well, swimming around with the koi fish. I love these guys because they look so prehistoric with their big paddle nose. And then they do this incredible thing where they open up their mouth really wide. It's gaping wide when they just kind of float and swim through the water and take in all of the little microorganisms to feed on. 
It kind of reminds me of like a basking shark or a whale shark, the way that they do that. Next on we moved to the African fish. So these are the African river fish. They had the Nile river fish as you can see here. And then next to them they had some Congo river fish. Really beautiful fish. They had these beautiful Congo tetras, a really beautiful rainbow colored tetra that school really nicely as well. And if you keep them in an aquarium where the sunlight hits them, they give off this beautiful shimmery effect with their scales too. Then they also had some African moonies in here. So these guys, I believe, are brackish water fish too and can be converted to full salt water. I really liked this Zambezi river setup because they had a nice little cage on the right hand side too for the fish to swim through. These guys are called scatties or African scatfish and you can find these guys in Eastern Africa but they also can be in Madagascar, New Guinea and Northern Australia as well. And then you'll also see they had that African version of the lungfish as well in this tank. And again, these guys like hard alkaline to brackish water conditions too. We then moved on to the Asian and Indian river fish and these tanks were just beautiful. They had so many plants in them. They had a bunch of six foot tanks and then they had some smaller two foot tanks that were really tall. So you could look at these huge lotus flowers or lotus plants that were rising to the top of the tank and view the lily pads from underneath and see all of the fish swimming under there, which was just magnificent. It was something that you really have to see in person. They had a bunch of these general kind of barb fish, denizen barbs I think they were, and some pearl spotted cichlids too. So again, a nice, beautiful, natural biotope. So we've got some catfish in here, some denizen barbs, aurelius barbs, and we've got some pearl spot cichlids as well. Looks like these guys might be breeding down here. You can see the denizen barb here as well. And I love the branch, how it juts into the water like that. That's really, really gorgeous. You can see there's lots of these glass fish, glass catfish in there as well. And there are apparently some clown loaches in here, which I can't spot, which is unusual because normally when there's clown loaches in a tank, you see them swimming everywhere. But I can definitely see plenty of those glass fish at the top. And I think there's some minnows there as well, some white cloud mountain minnows that they're swimming along with. And so these are our Asian and Indian river fish still. Hopefully this gives you some inspiration as well, like some ideas for types of fish that you could keep together and how you could give them these nice biotope looking aquariums as well. Oh, we got some kissing gourami. You know what's really cool about this too? It's actually teaching me where some of these fish come from. So some of these fish, I didn't actually really know where they came from. I knew they existed in the aquarium trade, but for example, I didn't know that kissing gourami are from the Asian and Indian rivers. And then in one of the tanks, I spotted these little guys called pipefish. I've seen a Neno variety of them here in Australia, but you don't see them too often. I also couldn't spot them in this aquarium here. So I'll show you some footage that I got from Tennessee Aquarium's YouTube channel. And it turns out that these guys, you must be able to get some larger varieties because the ones at Tennessee Aquarium look quite large. I also thought that you had to feed them live food normally to encourage them to eat, but it looks like, just like seahorses, they're picky, but they can learn to eat frozen brine shrimp and things like that, as long as it's kind of moving through the water. But they can be a really nice little nano fish if you're willing to put in the effort. Now, this tank was beautiful. This was the archer fish setup that they had. These archer fish were still kind of on the smaller side, so they get a little bit bigger than that. But they had it set up so that you could see above the water surface too. And it was really nicely planted with some mangroves, I believe, because again, these are a brackish water fish or can live in brackish water. So what you can do is you can pop like a little cricket or something on the plants and what these archer fish actually do is they get some water in their mouth and they shoot it at where the animal is or the bug is to knock it off the branch or the leaf into the water so then they can eat it. This was one of my favorite setups. I just think it looked so natural and so beautiful. And then we moved on to the Southeast Asian streams. And these aquariums were where some of the big boys resided, like the Asian arowana, some of the clownfish that are very invasive in Florida now as well. And some of the giant gouramis too we saw in there. Now these fish tanks were something else. 
but they were huge probably at least 10 foot long I would say, but that wasn't the most incredible thing about them. The incredible thing was is that it was like a whole world in there. This habitat actually extended to above ground as well. They had all of these trees and plants as well that you could see almost like a river bank. So you can actually walk in there if you work there to you know move things around and feed the fish and do maintenance and everything. It also went really tall and I believe that it was natural sunlight that was coming down into the aquarium as well, lighting it up and that sunlight was there for all of the plants too. So when you look at it, it almost looks like it's a picture from far away that they're using, but that is real. That is the actual plants that are above the tank. And then get ready, the moment that we've been waiting for, or at least that I've been waiting for, we moved on to the African lake tanks. So for those who don't know, I keep some African cichlids from Lake Malawi and you can also get them from two other lakes, there's Lake Tanganyika and Lake Victoria. And what makes these fish incredibly unique is that they are isolated to these three habitats in the whole world. So they're only endemic to these three lakes and these are called rift lakes. So there's a lot of volcanic activity around them and the water is very high pH, so around 8.2 because of all of the type of stone and rock that is mixing in with these lakes. These fish also in terms of color are probably the closest freshwater fish that you could get to looking aesthetically like a saltwater fish, especially ones from Lake Malawi, which you can see here. They come in really bright colors. This here is a mix of peacock cichlids. You'll also see some bigger ones that are haps and some what they call rock dwelling cichlids or embuna. And the embuna have a little bit of a rounder face and they tend to graze more on algae than what the haps and the peacocks do. So these haps and peacocks are a little bit more free swimming. Compared to the other tanks that we've seen, you'll notice too that these tanks tend to look overstocked. And this is a comment that I get a lot about my tanks as well, from people who mean well, uh, because I don't blame you. If you look at it, it does look like there's too many fish in the tank. However, the reason for this is because the lakes where these fish come from are technically overstocked too. Not overstocked to the point where it's detrimental for the fish, but they like to live in these crowded environments. It's just what they're used to because they're a very, very social fish. So what actually happens if you don't put enough African cichlids in a tank, then they become very aggressive to each other because the social hierarchy ends up being dominated by a few fish or just one fish and that fish can start to kill off other fish that it sees as a threat and pick on them. Whereas when you have a lot of the fish in the tank, it starts to diffuse that aggression and you end up with other fish that can stand up to that tank boss as well. Like Tanganyikan ones, they aren't as colorful, their hierarchies and their socializing behavior. I'm going to be setting up a tank of these guys soon, so I haven't actually personally kept Lake Tanganyika cichlids, but I've heard from a lot of people that they can have some really interesting dynamics and can be a little bit more entertaining to watch compared to the African Lake Malawi cichlids that tend to just kind of swim around and attack each other a little bit. We continue on with another Lake Tanganyika tank. I really like these ones too with the interesting head shape. So I think some of the like Tanganyika and cichlids have some, instead of having as many interesting colors, they get some interesting shapes to them. And we've got a big Cyodontus catfish down there, I believe it is. Okay, and then we've got the classified, this one is Lake Victoria. So I thought these trophies were from Lake Tanganyika, but maybe they're not. But maybe they've just kind of mixed them together again, I'm not too sure. But we've got some trophies or trophies in here as well and some shell dwellers. So I think this is definitely a Lake Tanganyika tank still. I might be wrong, but I think that's the case. And so these are another really popular type of African cichlid or Lake Tanganyika cichlid too. These shell dwellers, a lot of people really, really love keeping these guys because of their really fascinating behavior. They like to live in these little shells and they do plenty of breeding and stuff. We've got a little Lake Lupi in here. This is actually good, it's kind of giving me a bit of an idea of what you can keep together. Granted, this tank is very, very large and there's lots of places for them to spread out, but still very interesting to see because look at this. Like, just look at that. It's got a waterfall that goes into the tank. This place is incredible. And then next to it, 
I'm thinking this one must be Lake Victoria, because what else could it be? But I've never seen the Lake Victorian cichlids before, actually. So this one looks very red. The tent. I'm not too sure why people don't tend to keep the Lake Victorian cichlids as often or why you don't see them that much. Maybe there's not as many variety and the Lake Malawi ones kind of suffice. But it's definitely interesting seeing what the habitat can look like as well. Really, really beautiful. I love, actually love the red algae in there. Not only do they have fish aquariums, they've also got an alligator aquarium on display too. It was so huge. And so again, the sunlight comes through, like natural sunlight from the roof, and they've got a little forest canopy above them. They can bask on the rocks. And then in the water, there's some flower horns. These must be the happiest flower horns in the world. They've got the best aquarium ever, as long as the alligators don't eat them. But I'm assuming that they get well fed enough that they don't go after the fish. And then we moved on to the Asian lakes, and these had some of my favorite aquariums. Again, really beautiful planted aquariums. It's not something that you get to really see in many home aquariums, so it's cool being able to see it in a place like this. And I honestly didn't know that there was an aquarium in the world like this that existed that isn't a pet store, but it's an actual aquarium just for viewing fish and appreciating freshwater fish along with saltwater fish. So that's really, really cool. Just beautiful. Some of them looked even more rainforesty as well. They had actual trees that were going into the water, so real trees and branches with their roots, so you could see the underwater part and then the above water part as well. You can see that, and then you go below the water and you've got all of the beautiful fish in here. Just gorgeous. This one is really interesting. It's got a bunch of big cichlids in there. So I've got some black belt cichlids, it says. And a Midas cichlid. I thought, that, I thought that was a flower horn, but I'm not sure. Maybe not. These guys are so big. And then next door, we've got a little turtle exhibit. So let's see if we can find some turtles in here. And they even had a cute little turtle set up as well. These turtles were adorable. I'm not 100% sure what type of turtles they were. Maybe someone can comment down below and let me know. But they were swimming together up and down, which was really cute to see. And then we moved on to some of the island and lake aquariums. These ones were actually surprisingly really nice. I thought they might be a little bit more boring because they're more kind of the general salt water fish that you see around the city and stuff, but they were really beautiful. Some more planted setups. It'd be so interesting knowing the lights and stuff that they use on these tanks. I can't even imagine how much effort goes into maintaining all of these. So we've got some Madagascar killifish in here as well. Beautiful. So now we've got some great lake exhibitions to check out in here. I liked how they still went with the biotope look for these ones too. So they made it look like a wharf or a city bank, river bank, and then had the fish swimming around those areas. Pretty sure when I was looking at the map of America, Chicago was not on an ocean. And so it just turns out that that's how big the lake is. It literally looks like a beach, it's like a freshwater beach and so I can't even imagine the variety of fish that would live in there but I guess we don't have to imagine now, we can see what they look like from looking at these tanks. Now I'm not exactly sure which ones belong to which lakes or whether they're just all combined because it's kind of just made it all just about 
the Great Lakes and the things that live in the Great Lakes. But I really like these two. Look how gorgeous these ones are. I love how they've got like a wharf or something going down into that one. And this one, they've let the algae grow, but it looks so beautiful, especially with these fish in there. And so in Chicago, there is actually one of the Great Lakes as well, which we actually drove past when we were on our way to the Lincoln Park Zoo. And that Great Lake is called Lake Michigan. I didn't know this existed. And the other thing they get are snapping turtles too. I saw plenty of those while I was here in America. I love the snapping turtles. I think they're so sweet. Another one I met at Ohio Fish Rescue and at Greg Zachaland too. Why are these great, great lake tanks in particular so scratched up? But they're really pretty. Beautiful fish. So these are trout, I believe. And then another gorgeous great lake tank. So this one's got some big fish in it again, but it's got that nice long bow as well, all the way to the roof of the aquarium, which is like four feet high. So pretty. You could just spend hours here. I don't even touch that. This is a fish tank. Look at this. Have you ever seen an enclosure like this? These turtles here, they are absolutely living the dream. This is like turtle paradise in here. Huge above and below. And they've literally even got waterfalls going into the tank. There's not many fish that have a waterfall like that in their enclosure. So beautiful. Another gorgeous one. I actually think that these Great Lake ones are some of my favorite aquariums we've got here. But I guess these are all such big fish, they're not fish that you would typically keep in the aquarium industry, like as, at a hobbyist level at home. And then if you come over here, they've got this big, huge aquarium. These guys are, which I'm guessing if they're in the Great Lakes here, they must be invasive species, which probably isn't great. These carp are very good at getting out and eating everything and breeding a lot. And then next door, we've got one of my favorite fish too that I see here a lot in America. That is the alligator gar. But I love these guys because they look so prehistoric. And then below them, we've got some sturgeons too. So I saw a beautiful white one of these at one of the ponds at Greg's Aqualand. We've got some smaller gar up the back as well. A fish that's resting there on the log behind and again it's so beautifully planted as well and the nice natural algae like just look at that that is just gorgeous this is like fish heaven in here some very interesting fat little catfish in this tank here, all kind of like congregating around the air bubbles. Very interesting. <laughs> I love this fish, it's so cute. This little whiskers. And then we came across these guys, which I could have gone my whole life not seeing. They gave me instant goosebumps when I saw them with all of their teeth together like that. So these guys are called sea lampreys. And what they do is they actually attach themselves to a fish with their mouth and their teeth, and they actually suck the fish's blood out of it until the fish dies. And that's how they eat their prey. So not very nice. It's actually giving me goosebumps even talking about it and it makes me feel itchy. And so these are invasive as well, which makes it even worse. So they shouldn't even be here. So these poor fish having to deal with these guys. Um, I think that sometimes the fish will survive because maybe it doesn't interest the sea lamprey to kill the fish. So if they do survive though, it leaves a really deep wound in the fish. And I can't imagine that anyone would want to keep these in their fish tank, if you're even allowed to, since they're an invasive species. Has anyone ever seen these before? If you have, comment down below and let me know if you know anyone that keeps these or if you've ever kept them. Anyways, moving on from the sea lampreys, they included some other invasive species in these lake setups too. So they had some carp, which are basically like koi fish, but not quite as nice. 
probably more closely related to goldfish and how goldfish get when they are out in the wild, when they escape aquariums. So this is why if you ever need to give up your fish because you can't keep them anymore, always give them to a pet store. They'll generally take them in and then sell them to someone else or give them away for free to someone. But you never wanna put your pet fish in the wild because then they get into the ecosystem and they can wreak some havoc because oftentimes fish like goldfish will outcompete the other fish there. So they can eat more of the resources that the native fish eat, or they might even eat the native fish and they breed really quickly and they just end up taking over and really messing things up. Really that concludes our tour of Shed Aquarium. There was actually a little bit more to see, like some outside areas too, but I didn't get a chance to film them because I didn't leave nearly enough time to get through here. I arrived at around 4 o'clock and they closed at about 6 p.m. But if you were going to go to this aquarium, I would allocate a whole day for it because there is just that much stuff that you can do. There's even sections where you can go and touch some of the sharks and stuff or feed some of the fish little uh, touch pools with starfish and everything. And you can just spend your time walking around really slowly, enjoying all of the fish tanks. It is a great place for a family to go, a great place even for a date, or even if you're just an adult and by yourself like me and wanted to go and check out the fish, it is just absolutely fantastic. So this is Shed Aquarium in Chicago. I really hope you enjoyed seeing a little bit of Shed Aquarium. It's definitely worth taking a trip to, as you can see, it's really fascinating being able to see all these different types of biotopes and fish from different habitats in the world and such beautiful scapes too. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give it a like. Let me know what your favorite habitat and fish tank was. And if you're enjoying my content, definitely subscribe to my channel and you can hit that little bell notification to get notified each time I upload a new video because for this American trip, I've got plenty more content, more content to upload that I've made a little playlist of as well for you to check out. I've visited heaps of places like a high fish rescue, uh, Aqualand in Chicago, Brian Barchek's Reptarium as well, the King of DIY's place, so there's lots of content to check out. So definitely make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.